All right, so let's continue our discussion of stock, which is primarily what this chapter is about. And there are some things that we need to consider and principally, why would someone invest in stock of a company? Well, you might be thinking to yourself, well, as an investment, and that's absolutely right. So we've got some, we've got some, uh, some characteristics of stock here. And it says here that um, it says the right to vote in matters concerning the corporation. Now, these are, these are major matters. If you recall from our previous PowerPoint video, we had a little <clears throat> hierarchy and we and uh, of how things work with a publicly traded company. And at the very top of it were the stockholders, the board of directors. They were number two, right? So um, what that essentially means is that while the day-to-day -day management and the board of directors handle... Um, you know, day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month operations, major policies are still voted upon by the stockholders. And we've got here common stock only. We've got, there are some other types of stock that uh, investors can own, but voting rights uh, are only for uh, common stockholders. This number two reason is a little bit incomplete here, but it says, uh, we invest in stock for the right to share in distributions of earnings, unlike bondholders. Remember, bondholders are creditors, but when we own stock in a company, we are owners, and these distributions are also known as dividends. Dividends. And that's going to be our primary focus in this chapter because... Um, that's where the internal accounting is going to uh, take place. In other words, when a company pays dividends, they have to, they have to make certain journal entries and account for that, um, and it has a, a direct impact on uh, stockholders' equity. And you may say to yourself, well, wait a minute, what if I just want to invest in a company because I'm hoping that the, that the value of the uh, stock goes up. Well, that's an absolutely legitimate reason, but keep in mind, you're probably buying that stock on the secondary market. Say so you buy it for $80 and you say, okay, when this gets to $150, I'm going to sell it. But that doesn't, we're approaching this chapter from the perspective of the accounting for um, stock issuance and dividends and so forth from the company's perspective. That would all be a personal motivation of the investor okay but however these distributions these do these are a part of the accounting records by way of dividends statement of retained earnings uh, and the stockholders equity section of the balance sheet all right so this is an important uh, reason and then also if the corporation does happen to liquidate that means uh, goes out of business after we pay off the bondholders and our other creditors, uh, owners of stock uh, do have a right to share in what is left. Okay, uh, Shares of stock are often assigned a, a dollar amount called par value. And, um, you know, it says here, if we skip down a little bit, it says to protect creditors, some state laws require corporations to maintain a minimum amount of paid in capital. And uh, so what we're, what we're talking about here, and you know, we have this stuff called no par stock. I'm not really going to get into that. But when we talk about par value, what you, what you may have in, in, say, for example, a corporate charter is that, um, is that this corporation um, immediately has the right to issue 100,000 uh, 100, shares of, of $1 or par value stock or one cent par value stock. So, uh, you know, for all practical purposes, uh, the, the par value is, you know, it, it says that it's to protect creditors, but really it's, it's more of a, um, a legal item that has to be listed 
in the uh, in a company's articles uh, of incorporation, and I suppose there is a, a bit of protection for creditors as well. So let's say that we, you know, in a, a moment ago we were referencing a an investor that wants to buy stock at eighty dollars and then sell it when it gets to one fifty. Well, that eighty dollars that they're paying. Um, one dollar of that, and I'm just making this as an example, is going to be reserved for this, what we call par value, okay? So nothing to worry about too much. It's not a major point of focus in most of what we're going to be looking at in this chapter, but do be aware that most stock has what we call a par value. All right, and it says we're in the section uh, types of stock. It says when only one class of stock is issued, it is referred to as common stock. So if you think back to your accounting one or your financial accounting, the you know the the chapter you know I don't know chapter two three something like that. The first time that you ever looked at a balance sheet, uh, what you may very well have uh, seen was a stockholder's equity section made up of only two parts, common stock and retained earnings. And that's to help simplify things so that you can get the hang of stockholder's equity and what we find on the balance sheet. However, uh, oftentimes companies actually have many more than one type of stock that they sell. And so uh, here in this middle paragraph, it says when a corporation issues one or more classes of stock with variance preference rights, such as a preference to dividends, such a stock is called preferred stock. Okay, so if anybody ever asks you the question, um, what is so special about preferred stock, you would say, well, preferred stock is preferred as to dividends. We'll get to this a little bit more later, but if a company is going to pay out, let's say they, they're gonna, they decide that they want to pay out a million dollars in dividends, and um, the dividends that the preferred stockholders are entitled to to total you know, uh, 800,000, and the common stockholders are entitled to 2 million, well, the preferred stockholders are getting uh, 800,000 and the common stockholders are getting the other 200,000. So they have preferential treatment as to dividends and that is the most important thing. Interestingly, preferred stockholders are not allowed to vote. Common stockholders are. Okay, uh, so it says here the dividend rights of preferred stock are stated either as dollars per share or as a percentage. Uh, for example, 8% um, so we might say $50 par, 8% preferred stock. And what that would mean if we were to, if we were to look at a, um, let me just find the calculator here. If we were to look at um, this $50 par stock, and we were to multiply that by 0 0.08, it just so happens that it does come out to $4. Um, so what we could kind of say here is that for each share of $50 par preferred stock, um, dividend rights equal $4 per share, okay? So even though uh, preferred stockholders do have first rights, i.e. preference to dividends that are declared by the corporation, uh, and they do in fact have a greater chance of receiving dividends, much more so than common uh, stockholders, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, dividends, even for preferred stockholders, are generally not guaranteed. We'll get into kind of an exception to that here in a little bit. But it says, since dividends are normally based on earnings, a corporation cannot guarantee dividends even to preferred shareholders. So as a rule, um, you know, if a company de decides that they want to pay $1 million in dividends and we don't have $1 million in uh, income for the year, we either have to just not pay dividends at all or um, we have to reduce the amount of dividends that we're going to pay. And that affects 
certainly is going to impact the common stockholders, but it will also impact uh, preferred stockholders as well. All right, so with those uh, dividend preferences that we just uh, discussed in mind, we have a, a nice little diagram here that shows kind of the money available for dividends that a company uh, has to pay out. And there's only so much of it. So we're going to put the, we're going to put the preferred stockholders at the front of the line and we're going to pay them off first. Then if there's anything left, we're going to say, okay, we're going to take the uh, total amount of common stock and we're going to kind of divide that into whatever's left over. And then we're going to distribute that uh, based upon ownership at that point. If there's nothing left for common stockholders, um, then any given year uh, they may not get dividends. Usually though this is not the case. Usually uh, companies are pretty good about uh, making sure that they can meet dividend uh, obligations because they want to keep everybody happy. They want to keep preferred stockholders happy and common stockholders happy. But we do need to understand that sometimes things happen and um, you know, we were going to pay out this much in dividends. Now it has to be reduced uh, and so forth. So do keep that in mind. Speaking of these dividends, you know, how does this happen? How does the process of a company paying dividends out happen? And we're going to talk about this uh, a little bit later in the presentation, but we do want to make sure that we understand that it's those boards, uh, board of directors that are going to declare a dividend. And when they declare that dividend, there's actually going to be a liability on the books at that moment, even if we don't pay the dividend uh, for a while. So, you know, dividends are, are a big deal. When, when a company uh, declares dividends, they're keeping their, uh, their stockholders um, generally like that. It's a good way to, to attract ownership. Uh, but once we declare this dividend, we do have a liability. So there's a lot of moving parts here. Okay. Again, we're going to get into um, all of the steps of from declaring a dividend to actually paying a dividend here in a little bit. Uh, but I do want you to understand, you know, we went through that, that sequence of who has preferential treatment as to dividends. Um, but ultimately, it is the board of directors that's uh, making this uh, declaration in the first place for a certain amount of money to be paid out in dividends. All right. So we've got a little bit more that we need to talk about in terms of types of stock. And we're going to look at some uh, examples of some other types of stock or one of one other type of stock, at least available to stockholders. But before we do that, I, I just kind of want to run down through the process of uh, issuing stock so that we can get kind of a, well, hopefully get an idea of how this will impact the balance sheet. So we said earlier that, you know, back in our, in the very beginning of our accounting education, the first time we looked at a balance sheet, there's a very, very good possibility that the very first balance sheet we looked at, if we can even remember it, right, uh, for, the, for the stockholders' equity section of the balance sheet, we probably saw two things. We probably saw common stock and retained earnings. And we said that common stock was owner investment in the company and retained earnings are company earnings that have been retained by the company and not paid out uh, in, in the form of dividends uh, to owners. But a lot of these publicly traded companies have two or three uh, easily uh, types of uh, stock that they sell. We, and we can even break that those down into different classes and so forth. So I just kind of want to give you uh, kind of the rundown here of what's going on. To, and kind of a reminder of what stock is all about. Stock is a, is a way to raise money. If you have looked at, now if you've had one of my classes, we've already looked a little bit at the statement of cash flows in the first accounting class. And we, you know, we said that one of the financing activities that a company is involved in is issuing stock. That's a financing activity. When we sell stock, uh, in the company that is a that is a financing cash inflow 
and here we have a journal entry to show this. So I want you to understand uh, from the investor's perspective, they're hoping for stock appreciation and maybe some dividends. But the corporation is doing this to grow the company, to raise money. So here we have a situation where a company has issued, let's see, what have they done? They've issued 10,000 shares of $100 preferred stock. I'm sorry, they've authorized that. Okay, and then they've authorized 100,000 shares of $20 par common stock. They've actually issued, remember there is a difference, they've actually issued 5,000 shares of the preferred stock and 50,000 shares of common stock at par for cash. So we have this journal entry here. We got cash of 1.5 million and that's made up of $500,000 issued in preferred stock. How did we get that? Well, we took the 5,000 shares that were actually issued of preferred stock and we multiplied it by the, uh, let's see, what was it? $100 uh, par. So we have $100 par times 5,000 equals 500,000. And then we also have um, 50,000 shares of common stock issued at $20 a piece. And so let's see, let's bring that back over here. $20 par value for the common stock times 50,000 shares equals $1 million. So this is just kind of to show you uh, in action what we talked about before in, in another class actually uh, related to uh, financing cash inflows. So this is what we would call equity financing. Always associate the word equity uh, when it comes to financing with the with uh, the word stock. Okay. Now I told you that there was another kind of stock that we were going to talk about I didn't want to convolute the, uh, you know, the message because we also have this stuff called cumulative preferred stock. And um, cumulative preferred stock is a type of preferred stock. It's actually a step up from regular preferred stock. It says it has a right to receive regular dividends that were not, that were not uh, declared in prior years. Okay, whether they were declared or not doesn't matter. So just regular preferred stock is, we're going to call that non-cumulative preferred stock. And that just means that they have preference over common uh, stockholders as to dividends. But, but if there's not enough money to go around, then neither side gets their money. And next year, uh, neither side gets their dividends. And the next year we start all over again. But Cumulative preferred stock is a little bit different. These stockholders have a right to the dividends um, on the stock certificate. So we gave the example before a $50 par stock uh, that pays an 8% dividend, $4. Well, if you own, let's just say you own five of those shares, you'd be entitled to $20 in dividends, regardless of whether there's a declaration of stock or not. Okay. So if a company does not pay dividends to these cumulative preferred stock, we say that the dividends accumulate. That's where we're get, getting this word cumulative. Um, and cumulative preferred stock dividends that have not been paid in prior years are said to be in arrears. What that means is we're behind on paying. So to complicate the matter a little bit further, any preferred dividends in arrears held by uh, cumulative preferred stockholders must be paid before any common stock dividends are paid. Okay. And then we're going to say that any dividends in arrears are normally disclosed in the notes to the financial statements. And the reason that we want to do that is because uh, by doing this, we let potential investors in common stock know, hey, um, we usually pay dividends, but first year or so, you need to be aware you may not get any dividends because we have these dividends that are in arrears. Okay, so we have a little example here. It says, to illustrate, assume that a corporation has issued 
1,000 shares of cumulative preferred $4 stock, uh, $50 par. So here they're just telling us what the dividend is amount is. It's $4. And 4,000 shares of common stock, $15 par. The corporation was organized on, uh, let's see, January 1 of 2000, we'll just say 21, and paid no dividends in 21 and, and 22. In 2023, the corporation paid $22,000 in dividends, of which $12,000 was paid to preferred stockholders and $10,000 was paid to common stockholders, as says computed as shown on the next slide. So let's just take a look at that. And here it is. So we've got the total dividends paid is $22,000. But because we're talking about uh, cumulative preferred stock, we had $4,000 in arrears from 2021, another $4,000 in arrears for 2022, and then we also have the current $4,000 for 2023, and that totals $12,000. The good news for common stockholders is that they still have $10,000 uh, of this $22,000 that can be distributed to them. So all is not lost.